Appamata and its programs are supported by your generosity and your generosity and support makes such a difference. You can find a link for contributions on the website at appamata.org. Thank you. Gosh, about six weeks ago, we had a Sangha meeting that I was here leading. Oh, my brother just arrived. He's not in here yet. He's, I'll, I'll admit him. Um, anyway, six weeks ago, we met to um, speak about um, how we might purchase um, the Zendo um, with our senior teacher, Peg, moving to um, Chicago to be with her family. And I'm excited that Friday, um, our Sangha member, Nelda Adamson, who's here, um, completed the purchase of the property, which also in the way of real estate meant that Peg could complete the purchase of um, a home that she found in Winnetka outside Chicago. And so um, thank you for all of your input on that. And I imagine that um, as things will continue as they have been, and then when we are able to be physically together, um, the um, Nelda intends to live in the back house um, as Peg did, and uh, Appamata will rent the front house as we did from Peg, but from Nelda. And then um, our Sangha will start a process of really thinking about what a permanent home might look like. So um, that's a brief update on that. So it's 10 o'clock, we're all here. And I wanna take a moment just um, to invite those of you that aren't on, aren't on camera to um, put your camera on so that we can see your beautiful face. And um, let's just take a moment taking, drinking one another in. Um, I'm hoping to see my brother. He's just a name right now. That's very sweet. He's in Oklahoma. And he actually introduced me to Buddhism because he went to India when he was in college. And he's eight years younger than me. So it's good to see all of you. And so um, I'll assume that you can hear me all right. Um, so, okay, great. And in a few minutes, I'll ask Nancy, who's our monitor, to um, actually put up some um, information on the desktop because I think um, some of what I'm talking about may be just easier to visualize. And so, um, as you all know, um, if you're in the US, though I see at least Claudine here, who is in Switzerland, and I haven't noticed if there's anyone else abroad, um, but um, that um, uh, Monday is a national holiday uh, for Martin Luther King Jr. Um, in celebration of his birthday, which I believe actually was yesterday. So um, I thought it'd be a great idea to think some about how um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy of nonviolence, which I feel like we all kind of vaguely know about, how it actually literally shares roots with Buddhism. It is um, at the core of that thinking. And it's very interesting to think about since of course he was a Christian minister, he obviously wasn't Buddhist. Um, and so my goal today is to, um, I'm by no means a King scholar, far from it, um, but my hope is to unpack King's philosophy of nonviolence and then offer all of us um, his six steps for nonviolent social change, which I think is gonna be really useful um, whether you're in the US or in another country um, as we continue to meet the challenge of the pandemic and the economic um, uh, really crisis um, that um, is a result of that. And of course, climate crisis. Um, through King's philosophy, um, I also think that we can more fully enact 
the precepts that many of us have taken, the 10 sort of commandments, if you will, of Buddhism, and also embody our bodhisattva vow, our vow to, um, you know, uh, stay here and bring freedom to as many people and beings as we can. So first, a confession. Um, until a, a confession I'm not proud of, uh, until uh, probably four years ago, I um, was pretty ignorant about Martin Luther King Jr. I didn't think I was. Um, I knew he was a gifted orator. Um, of course, I heard his speeches. I loved them. Um, I knew he was a brave civil rights leader. And of course, that he was a Christian minister. But, and all those are true, but what I didn't understand is that he actually is arguably one of our country's greatest philosophers and thinkers. And that really excited me to begin to know that. Um, and so I was also excited though later I thought, why should I not have known this? And I think now it's in children's books um, that Reverend King was an ardent student of Mahatma Gandhi, who was, of course, Indian. He was an Indian lawyer and activist who was born in India, but actually grew up in South Africa, which I also didn't know. Of course, none of this was taught in school when I was coming up. And so Gandhi first applied the principles that I'm gonna introduce in just a minute that will not be new to you. Um, in uh, growing up and living as an attorney in South Africa as someone who was considered colored because he was um, from India. And then later when he moved to India, um, he um, then of course led um, the um, end of um, imperialism and uh, British rule in um, India. And so, um, Nancy, could you share the screen and, and just pull up that first page of the PDF? And just so you know, um, you can, um, if you want to see your fellow um, Avamadians, um, oh, that's funny, the spacing weirded out a little bit. Oh, well, that's good, that's good. You can stop right, yeah, there, it's good. Um, you can make uh, the box on the right or wherever you're seeing it with the faces bigger. Um, you can play with that or just ignore it. Um, and I won't have this up the whole time, but I think there are just some things that will be um, easier to see. And so um, Nancy, you're good where you are. Um, there should be a page break after um, the second line. And I don't know what happened to that, but that could be, that is obviously me. Um, and so I want to introduce and remind us of these two concepts, which were key to Gandhi's um, philosophy of nonviolence. Uh, ahimsa, which literally in Sanskrit means nonviolence. And of course, that's our first precept, literally the word ahimsa. And then the second um, sort of pillar of Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence was satya, truth. And of course, that is one of the six paramitas or perfections in Buddhism, or to put it in more plain language, one of the six values that um, a Buddhist is committed to cultivating in their personhood. And so ahimsa, nonviolence, and satya, truth. Gandhi, though he was raised Hindi, he, um, I think, was, sounds as if he was sort of pan um, spiritual. And he believed that those two values, truth and nonviolence, were central to all religions. And um, he sort of boiled down these two concepts when he spoke with regular people as um, truth force or soul force. And that calls forth something that we'll get to in King's philosophy, but this idea of force, 
that nonviolence and truth practicing those aren't a passive activity, that they have oomph behind them. And so um, Gandhi wrote about um, enacting his philosophy that there is no such thing as a win lose confrontation because all our important interests are really the same. And I want us to pause for a moment to think about, he's saying this about literally ending British rule in India. So imagining that wherever you live, your country is occupied by another power and they basically run your country. They basically have given you their language and many aspects of their culture to the repression of aspects of your language and culture. And he is saying, there's no win or lose because all the really important things, they're the same for all of us. And I think you can kind of start seeing how um, King's philosophy was very much in line with that. And so now we'll switch from Gandhi to um, Martin Luther King, um, his philosophy. So Nancy, if you could scroll up just enough so that the triple evils all show, and then we can, we can kind of not see Ahimsa and Satya anymore. Great. Yeah, for some reason it just lost my page breaks, but that's cool. So um, the basics, so first off, um, from what I read, um, King first encountered um, Gandhi's teachings as in, in seminary school um, as part of, you know, probably an offering of, you know, world religions. And he was so impacted that he actually, actually traveled to India in 1959 um, to talk to people who knew Gandhi and really learn one-on-one um, -on -one more about how did Gandhi use these values of truth and nonviolence to affect such dramatic change in two countries, South Africa and India. So that's why it's no stretch at all to say that Buddhism is um, shares the same um, sort of um, DNA as King's philosophy of nonviolence because King really sought out Gandhi's ideas and Gandhi's ideas were of course um, out of his culture of India um, from which Buddhism also arose. And so now to um, kind of dive into King's philosophy, um, he, from what I have gathered, again, not an expert at all, um, but I've done some reading. Um, he had a very, um, I think when I uh, have seen documentaries and, and done reading about um, the civil rights movement, um, I could see that it was about action and you'll, we'll get to that. But what I didn't realize is that underneath it was a structure of thinking about how one interacts with the world. And so key to that sort of foundational was Dr. King's um, triple evils. And basically these are three forms of violence that are interrelated. And he believed that when we work to remedy one of these, it affects all of them. And so the three triple evils, um, and this is um, starting at this point, this is completely Dr. King's philosophy. Um, we're leaving Gandhi, we're taking Buddhism along with us, um, but this is King. And this is from the, the King Center's website. And then in some places, um, I reference what book. So the triple evil, evils, poverty, racism, and militarism. And it's easy to, to think, well, yeah, all three of those things are really bad. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is to really go deeper and see how poverty um, in the way that King viewed it and in this idea of there being three um, sort of 
um, evils or um, categories of violence. Um, poverty is also unemployment. It means um, you know, lack of access to um, schools, um, uh, quality schools. Um, it means um, you know, grocery store deserts, which you may have heard of, of neighborhoods that don't have um, access to grocery stores. Um, it means infant mortality. So that means um, access to healthcare um, and of course, um, affordable housing. And secondly, racism. Well, that's obvious, right? Um, but that also includes not just prejudice, apartheid, um, segregation, but also ethnic conflict, anti-Semitism, sexism, colonialism, homophobia, transphobia, ageism, discrimination against people with disabilities, um, and stereotypes, um, aspects of um, um, policing, which we'll get more into in the next one, which is militarism. Of course, war, imperialism, colonialism, domestic violence, rape, um, and all the rest and including um, ways in which um, in our country, uh, criminal justice is um, carried out, et cetera. And so it doesn't take much imagination to start seeing how um, when families experience the trauma of rape or domestic violence, they um, are, um, poverty is connected and and racism and sort of othering other people um, is connected. And so um, those are the three triple evils that were sort of the focus of all of his work. And if we can go just up a little bit so that we can look at the six principles of nonviolence. Thank you. Um, and I'm so sorry that um, it's my fault that the little, the slides are a little wonky, um, but I thought some visuals might help. So um, as I mentioned, King taught that when we work to remedy one of these evils, we, we begin unwinding all of them because they're interconnected. And so he lays out a framework of, um, nonviolent framework of the mind um, in these six principles of nonviolence. And some of them are pretty obvious and others I think are quite surprising and really, um, and I think, and all of them resonate in one way or another with Buddhist practice um, to my mind. The first is that nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. It is active and it is aggressive spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Um, I feel like you could take out the word nonviolence and put in Buddhism and say Buddhism is a way of life for courageous people. It is aggressive, it's active, it's aggressive spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. It is a commitment. And um, I think that principle, um, yeah, really speaks to our practice. Second, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. It's really about reconciliation and negotiation and finding common ground. And um, certainly that is a very um, Buddhist way. It isn't about um, King writes to some extent about, it's not about there not being conflict, like a group um, even, even hit his group of um, followers or a particular group or our sangha might have conflict within it, um, but that we need it uh, in a nonviolent way. And that we are seeking um, through negotiation and listening, which we'll get into in a minute, um, we're seeking reconciliation and redemption. Third, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. And so in our liberating Dharma class, we speak a little bit about um, that it's not as much racist people, it's racist institutions. And so similarly, 
um, King's words were that um, that that evildoers are not evil people. They actually are victims of this larger system also. If you've had a chance to read My Grandmother's Hands by Resma, whose last name I'm not going to remember, he speaks about um, white bodies, black bodies, brown bodies, and police bodies, um, all having trauma going back and how we can heal that trauma in order to um, come together. Four, nonviolence holds that suffering for a cause can educate and transform people and societies. This notion, if you removed Buddhism, if you just like put that part of your brain away somehow, um, in our culture anyway, we're really not into suffering. We're like, mm -mm, don't want to suffer, mm, not signing up for that. But the acceptance of discomfort, not quite getting what you want when you want it, as being central to being human, is central to Buddhism. We get suffering. We may not like it any more than anyone else, but we understand that it's part of this human life and we are willing to be with it. We are called to be with it. And the idea that nonviolence accepts suffering without retaliation. When I think of the images from way back when during the civil rights movement, or I think of images much more recent, it's very humbling and sad to imagine accepting suffering without retaliation. That said, King taught, and I think Buddhism certainly um, avows that from suffering can come great learning and transformation. And I think many of us who have been practicing for a while may have experienced that in our own lives or in observing our spiritual friends, um, that when we don't do the comfortable thing of turning away from suffering, we go in with some help, not alone, and with our practice, um, we can be changed and experience the world in changed ways that we can't imagine and aren't even really responsible for. Five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Well, I mean, that's obvious, right? But this description, nonviolent love is spontaneous, unmotivated, unselfish, and creative. I thought, wow, that sounds exactly like Buddhism, right? The spontaneity, the, um, you know, anytime you've taken part in a intensive or um, in the morning, the spontaneity of Nancy, I think it was, I'm not even sure, maybe it was Laurie. Um, I got stuck behind every traffic light this morning and spontane spontaneously, the monitor started the clackers for which I'm very grateful. Um, creative, unmotiv unmotivated, unselfish. This is really core to our practice, how we meet life as it's unfolding. And it surprised me to find that um, in King's philosophy. And six, finally, these are the six principles of nonviolence, um, that the universe is on the side of justice. And, and you've heard that speech where he says, you know, I believe the arc of justice, you know, will, will um, continue. You know, we're, we're in the long game right now. Things are tough, but, you know, the arc of justice. Um, and what that reminds me of the line from the Shin Shin Ming, the, um, poem, the Chinese poem, Zen poem that Todd taught a few weeks ago. Um, there's a line, you can trust the universe completely. And I remember when I first, um, one of my first classes with Peg was actually studying this poem. I didn't realize it was a really important poem. I just was like, oh, it's a poem. Cool. I like poetry. Um, 
And I remember encountering this line, you can trust the universe completely. And it just seemed like the most outrageously out of touch, um, just, just not the way I was raised to think at all. Um, and I think I have come to see, um, recently I watched a series of videos on the climate crisis that um, were associated with the talk that the Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg gave, which you may have seen referenced on the Akamata list. And, you know, there's like a famous scientist saying, you know, Earth's going to be fine. We've done, Earth has done this before. Earth has done climate change. It, it's the beings on Earth that are, that are going to suffer and some of which become extinct. And so once you go to that level, you can trust the universe completely. It's, it's not about us. Um, and so um, King's philosophy, as I understand it, really taking a much bigger view um, when I know that I've observed in myself and in others around me that when um, grave injustices, when we become aware of them in our country, we want to act immediately. We want to go fix this immediately. And that's important energy. Um, but to really affect change, according to King, it's, it's the long game. And I think in Buddhism, that is also so. I may have referenced before a friend of mine who's um, Vietnamese American. Her parents came to the US from Vietnam. And so she's Buddhist. And she is a very modern, um, incredibly smart, very politically active um, feminist um, gal and mom of two. Um, very modern, I think is the point I'm trying to make and very liberal and socially engaged. And at the same time, her Buddhist ancestral teaching is six generations that, that she is just in a chain of generation after generation of practice and taking that larger view of her peace, which is limited in time and energy and so many things, but is crucial in this longer chain of activity. Um, I really appreciate that she thinks that way and it has encouraged me to to try to imagine thinking that way. That wasn't the way I was raised. And so those are the six principles, right? So we've got the three evils and then the six principles behind um, the actual actions. And so now we'll um, go on um, just scooting down a little bit. And I'm so sorry, I realized I sent you the wrong one, but that's fine. Um, the six steps of nonviolent social change. Oh yeah, Nancy's editing as we go. Love it. Spontaneity, creativity happening right now. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and so these are the actual, you know, not quite on the ground steps because I think, uh, well, I know that King um, and others gave very specific training on how to be in your human body in a nonviolent way when violence is being actually directed towards you. So this isn't getting down to that level, but it is about process. And I think in looking at these steps, I see how um, they could be applied in interpersonal relationships. I know um, recently I've been spending so much time with my husband that I'm like, is it that you, don't, you can't hear? Is it you're not listening or you don't remember? Or is it that I can't hear? I'm not listening or I don't remember. <laughs> and um, the kind of conflicts that arise um, in that situation. And so, um, so the six steps are um, not mysterious, but very sequential. And I think very um, um, process oriented. And you can kind of look at remembering um, the Montgomery um, bus strike and other, um, you know, the occupation of um, diners, um, other actions that King led through various groups, how 
if you go backwards from that videotape that you can remember, um, this is what's behind it. And so first information gathering. And what's interesting to me is not just becoming an expert on your side of the issue, but actually understanding your opponent's position, not because you want to get them, which would be so rewarding to a part of me, <laughs> um, but because you're going back to that that the the earlier thoughts that we that we're all connected and that that we all we have the same larger values. We just have to find where they are, right? And then once you've gathered this information, then education, that information going back out and informing others in your group, but also sharing this information for you know, the other side about the issue. These are really basic, but sometimes we can jump straight to um, either later steps of nonviolent social change or just skip over the nonviolence entirely. Three is I think a really interesting one. And this is where I think I really call us as Buddhists and um, many of us as white people, um, personal commitment. These are his actual words, daily check and affirm your faith in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. I think this is exactly what we do with Buddhism. You know, when we drag our butts out of bed and we show up to sit, um, or we don't, and we work with that, that we are constantly checking, am I still in this? Is this still what I think is the right thing for me at this time? Is this what I believe? And what's more, eliminating hidden motives. That kind of calls to mind what Flint sometimes has taught, uh, the curative fantasy, you know? Are we, are, what is our real motive? Why are we here? Um, you know, is it to look good or is it to become a better person? Of course we have all those parts, but just to be aware um, why you're here, why are you committed to this nonviolent social change? and preparing yourself to accept suffering if necessary. That one's pretty, pretty Buddhist. We've got a good practice for that. So, so number four in these six steps is negotiation. And again, these are, these are King's words um, from the King Center website, using grace, humor, and intelligence. Those are three just um, so essential and so sort of unexpected to me, uh, ways to meet, you know, if you're thinking of Gandhi meeting um, British leaders, if you're thinking of um, King um, meeting, um, you know, the mayor of um, Montgomery, Alabama, um, or other leaders in other communities, grace, humor, and intelligence. And so it's really about sort of just being human, finding where can we just be human together? Um, we may have very different views on whatever the social action issue is. Um, and then confronting the party with a list of injustices and a plan for addressing and resolving them. And I noticed some of you might be taking notes and I'm happy to send a um, clean version of this um, out on the list. And so you can keep taking notes. I know I think really well that way, but also know that you don't have to get it all down perfectly. Um, look for what is positive in every action and statement the opposition makes. This line really, wow. You know, to think about in the US, um, I will, I will send my notes. Um, to think about in the US what has been unfolding in our country the last, um, well, forever, but most recently the last five or so years to 
Look for what is positive. Is there something positive in this action? Is there something positive in something that the opposition says? And I'm thinking about yesterday in my doom scrolling, um, a woman uh, was apparently, uh, well, died in the um, mob insurrection and white supremacy takeover of our capital two weeks ago. A woman died, um, she was trampled uh, by a crowd and um, her story was kind of told and, and there was a man who was interviewed who had given her CPR and he was, he was visibly upset. He didn't know her, um, but he saw in this press of people up against the building that she had fainted and, and then, you know, kind of got to her under this crowd and was one of two people who gave her CPR um, and just a mass of pressed together people. And then um, I guess eventually they got her body, she didn't recover, um, into the Capitol. And so he came back out and he was talking to a reporter and he was, he was as anyone would be in that situation. He was heartbroken. This wasn't what he thought was going to happen. And so I think of that, that, you know, in the end, we all are human. And there are ways to find the good in the other side. And to not seek to humiliate the opponent, but to call forth the good. And so, as I understand it, you know, basically, if negotiation doesn't work, um, then that's when direct, CAC, direct action um, kicks in. And so this is where I begin to see the news clips of you know, actual action. Um, if the opponent is unwilling to enter into or remain in discussion and negotiation, um, actions are created to impose a creative tension into the conflict to supply moral pressure on the opponent to work with you in resolving the injustice. I'm just gonna read that sentence again because I don't know about you, but this is inspiring, energizing, and also just heady. Um, actions, direct actions impose a creative tension into the conflict, supplying moral pressure on the other side, to work with you in resolving injustice. I'm really excited by the positivity of that and how if that's the way that you're going into a situation, then you can weather some suffering because you're you're about, the direct action isn't the end, right? It's creating this tension that's going to bring people together because the negotiation didn't work. But it also takes that personal commitment. And so finally, reconciliation, which is stunningly beautiful. Nonviolence ultimately seeks friendship and understanding with the opponent. It's not about defeat, it's not about winning. It's what Gandhi said. Nonviolence is about opposition to systems, forces, policies, acts. It's not against people. And as King taught through reason compromise, both sides resolve the injustice with a plan of action. Um, that's a lot. Um, so I wanted to share those things as a way of inviting all of us to recommit to our practice of um, anti-racism and also to call out that um, as I was reading, beginning to read King, um, do scroll down a little bit, Nancy. I think there is uh, a note there. As I was beginning to read King's words a few years ago, 
I, um, oh, okay, that's, that's all there is. Okay, great. Um, that's the source for all of this information, the King Center, um, which I believe is in Atlanta. Um, as I was beginning to read King's writings and speeches, like a collection, um, a few years ago, um, perhaps you all know this, but I, I didn't know it. And it struck me as just, um, wow. Um, he um, actually wrote, and I don't remember the exact year, it was in the um, early 60s, early 1960s. Oh yeah, you can stop sharing now. Oh yeah, that's great. You can go there and then people can see it and then we can stop sharing. Um, that in the early 60s, King wrote, um, the real um, enemy of our race is, um, yeah, great. So you can find out more there and there um, are also, I think there's a list of his books as well. So Nancy, you can go ahead and shut that when you get a chance. Um, the King understood that the real, um, the real, I'm not sure what the right word is, but the real enemy of, of, um, his, of the civil rights movement was not white racists. It was moderate whites. It was us, many of us. It was good white people who weren't racist, didn't consider themselves racist. And we're like, okay, well, you guys just go, you, you black people go take care of that. And only in the last few years, I'm not proud to admit, have I understood that um, it's all of our work. In fact, it's mostly our work. Um, the more that one is a moderate uh, or liberal white person, the more it is our job. We have the power, we have the influence. And um, King, he, King knew that with complete clarity um, so long ago, actually about the time I was born. So all this white hair ago. And um, the final vision for King was um, this idea of the beloved community. And um, at first I thought that meant sort of like the lion and the lamb, you know, sort of metaphorical, um, but that's not at all what he um, envisioned. He um, believed that the beloved community was a realistic achievable goal. And he saw that it could be attained by a critical mass of people, not everyone. As my son says, he's 23, haters gonna hate. Um, but that a critical mass of people committed to and trained in the philosophy of nonviolence and its methods. He believed that it was possible. And a final quote from King, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community so that when the battle's over, a new relationship comes into being between the oppressed and the oppressor. And I think that is definitely what we all envision. Um, before we break into small groups for a few minutes of conversation, I wanna wrap up kind of the narrative part of this, um, which was very touching to me to read. Um, so, um, Gandhi lived to the age of 78, but he was assassinated at the age of 78, less than a year after Indian independence from British occupation. So he achieved his aim and then he was assassinated. Um, Dr. Well, the young man named Martin Luther King Jr. was 18 years old in 1948 when Gandhi was assassinated. And there's no way of knowing that at age 18, whether King was aware of that, I have no way of knowing. Um, and as I mentioned, King began to study and was pursued um, actively learning about Gandhi's um, methods and philosophy um, just a few years after that, um, but Gandhi was already gone. Of course, King was assassinated 20 years later in 1968, and he was 39 years old. So I want to pose a question, and maybe Nancy, you can uh, type it in. Um, 
I had a sort of brainy question, but I'm realizing that maybe what would be better to do in small groups is just sort of um, take some time to share what's moving through you with this information. And so um, the brainy question, which I'll still um, throw out is, of course, you've just like a bunch of information is just blown by you and some of it stuck and you can go learn more. But in what stuck, thinking about confrontations that you're aware of in our country, these, this idea of two groups that have different ideas about um, truth, right? Satya. And um, how, how might you, not alone, um, by, you know, how might you make a decision or think through joining up with an existing group? Um, so we probably don't need to create more groups. Um, to enact some of these um, ways of being and thinking. Um, but also in your small group, you could just um, reflect and share about how um, what you learned has moved through you. And um, I will say, um, I'd love to Nancy have groups of three and I will just, as a matter of care um, for anyone here who is um, non-white, um, I will invite when you guys are um, in a group with someone that's not white, um, I encourage you to um, care for them. Um, this is not a time for them to care for you. Um, that's something that we're teaching in Liberating Dharma. And so uh, we care for one another and um, so often um, people of color are asked to care for white people who are encountering information and ways of being in the world, um, possibly for the first time and um, as a result of our privilege. And so just knowing that um, let's take good care of one another and that might mean taking care of yourself. And so Nancy, um, let's do, um, gosh, it's already 10.46. It's gonna be kind of quick, but 10 minutes in small groups of three and divide the time up equally and don't spend a lot of time chit-chatting, just go right in and then Nancy will have you come back out. If you haven't done this before, you don't need to do anything. If it says, your computer says push a button, do it. Otherwise just go for the ride. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, welcome back. Thank you so much. That was that was incredible. Yeah. Good. I'm glad it was helpful. Very interesting. Yeah, I bet from uh, your perspective, Claudine, I assume, uh, are you from France originally? I, yes, but I am in Switzerland and I was a, a teacher for history. So uh -huh. I, I was very, very interested in all that and I'm very worried for what is coming this next time in United States. Right. Well, let's spend just a moment. I think our, our time went over and, um, but I think people are coming back. Um, but just briefly before we close. Oh yeah, here's everyone else. Yay, everyone came back. Um, we're um, running a, a little long on time, but I want to um, just briefly give folks a chance to offer anything that came up in their group and then we'll do um, our final um, just close which takes less than five minutes. Um, anyone want to jump in and share um, um, anything from your group that you would like to or from your own experience of the talk and how you're thinking about um, Dr. King and how maybe you're thinking about you will carry some of this forward um, both tomorrow um, national holiday no longer my day off 
and um, pass that. You can just uh, jump in or wave your hand wildly and I'll call on you. It looks like we've got one screen. Um, I wanted to mention a film that's coming up soon uh, for streaming called Healing from Hate that I, I saw a segment on TV about an interview with the um, filmmaker and one of the people in it. And um, it is based on uh, one of uh, a white supremacist who extricated himself from the movement. And it took him years and years. And he's, his work is now to find people that he can listen to that are in that movement and try to help them to get out. And um, one of the things that struck me was that he said the thing that, that he knows with a lot of them when he gets a chance to work with them is that some of them have never been listened to in their lives. And that this is, this is how he begins with them. So I thought that was a little bit of going back to information gathering in a way. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you have the name of the the documentary, will you put it in the chat? Um, and I, I welcome thoughts and other resources, but I really would like to, in our Buddhist practice, kind of, you know, be here now and um, just reflect back on, you know, your intention of coming to the talk, whether you had one or not, um, your experience of the talk, um, anything that moved through you or, um, you know, that sort of thing. Thank you, Rosemary. Yeah, Bridget and Claudine after that. I was thinking that if I know that this whole idea of listening and finding ways of, of approaching people on common ground was certainly well covered when Theory U, that book by Otto Sharmer, and I don't know whether our Monday night group has ever read that book, but it might be a way of enhancing our understanding about turning listening into action. Yeah, if um, if you could put the name of that book in, it's the word theory and the letter U. Yes. Um, in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, Claudine, coming from Switzerland. Yes. I just want to say that uh, something that I found very uh, important is the community of, of thinking between the people that want peace and nonviolence. You might be Christian, you might be Buddhist, Buddhist. You might be even uh, people with no faith at all, except humanism or whatever. It's all this common uh, way of thinking, and that is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Because if we look at what happens in your country just now, or it might happen here as well, because it's not that good. Uh, between people who believe in vaccination and people who don't believe and so on. There are fights all over the place. Uh, it's so important to, to see this, this shared goodwill it, and it gives a, a lot of hope and courage. And thank you for bringing that with your speech. That was very interesting and good to hear. Thanks for calling that out. That is something I learned in doing this research as well, and I think is true to King's philosophy and, and certainly of Gandhi's. Um, Nelda, you have your hand raised? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I want to bring it to a personal level and talk about the experience of um, compassion and inclusiveness. And from a personal level, much of what you said resonated and because I am, I, I'm Mexican. I grew up on the Mexican border in a ghetto. Um, and now I live a privileged life. And I've had the good fortune of experiencing both. I also grew up with a most compassionate school teacher father, mm -hmm. taught fifth, sixth grade for over 35 years. And it's from him that I learned my core values, who is now a Trumpster. And so, and so I've held both. Mm -hmm. I've grown up with being a minority 
and experience that both as a Mexican woman and as a woman. And yet I've been white enough to get that step up in job placements, in different things, and watched my law school colleagues lose jobs to me, just equally qualified because I was white enough. And I worked um, as a volunteer with the National Abortion um, Rights Action League for four years to fully understand, fully, that I can't speak for rights that seem selfish, that it's a man who must speak for me. Because although we all know that those rights, all human rights, are rights that we all benefit from, there's an impression in others' minds that if you're asking for rights that would benefit you, then, then you have a selfish cause at heart. And so it must be someone who seems to have no interest, seems to, because we all have interest in human rights, speak for us. So it's my place to speak for my African and Asian brothers and sisters. It's a man's place to speak for me and so on and so forth. And that's how we help and heal each other. And yes, of course, the thing that is hardest for me in my practice is to trust that the universe is unfolding as it should. And so all of it resonated deeply and thank you for sharing um, this lesson with us. Thank you everyone for sharing. Thank you. And I think what's key is, you know, um, Buddhism is all about practicing this middle way, right? Not, not too far this way, not too that far that way. And when we say, um, you know, the, the universe, um, you can trust the universe completely at the same time, it's with full commitment. And I, I love that um, in King's philosophy, he basically says, this shit's hard and you're going to hurt. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to make sure you're, you are in it, not to win it, but you're just in it for the whole arc. And that's just taking it down to like mm, level um, and so it's both things. It's trusting the universe and it's committing and acting every day. We fall off, we get back up, we fall off, we get back up. So um, any one last final comment before we do our final bows? Um, I see um, at least, oh, Jess. Yeah, you'll wind us up, Jess. Okay, I'll wind us up. Um, <laughs> well, uh, no, I was thinking about, you know, just with the, I was thinking about the riots and now Martin Luther King Day is coming. And I remember, Robin, you posting that that message to us to remember to have compassion and uh, for all beings, you know, and uh, um, and I was just, you know, kind of thinking about today's talk and and how it, it is really challenging. You know, I think that uh, that my grandmother's hands and, and what you're saying and Dr. King's messages about uh, you know, oppressor oppressed. Uh, the hope is that there's some reconciliation and that it's nothing, it's never about the person. It's always about the actions and trying to change the system and the, and the structure. And it's never about blaming. It's not blaming this person for it's not othering anyone. So it's really about these and just thinking about, I'm just processing this, thinking about like the Oh, Jess, our connection got... No, Jess went mute. Oh, oh Jess muted. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry, I don't know. So, yeah, what I was ago. saying is... You were saying I'm processing... Yeah. Processing it in like kind of the the three evils were never about any one person. It's always about the, the, the factors of the environment, the factors of the situation, and how do we transform them. And so kind of when I was watching the, the riots and all this, like, uh, it was hard not to feel blame, hard not to feel hate, hard not to feel these things. And then sort of seeing this broad perspective and then thank you for just the Martin Luther King, uh, uh, the vision and the philosophy and the, you know, sort of those, that, that thing, spitting each morning, is this the philosophy I really believe in? <laughs> it's just a thing that, you know, because it is, it's a powerful way of seeing the world and it has to start from there. So anyway, that sort of brought in um, all of those those things. Um, and I think, you know, in our group, yeah, Lori said at the end, like kind of nonviolent communication and Marshall Rosenberg, this idea of, you know, we are all human and have this basic set of needs. And so I think that othering is just 
um, anyway, so it's starting to, it felt like it was coming together, kind of these things that I was hearing. And thank you for um, your role in trying to bring these things together. Thanks. I think we're all processing in the same way. So I appreciate you sort of opening up your brain for us. Um, I noticed that um, Oprah's book club is, um, uh, I'm not exactly what all she's doing, but I happen to notice that um, a bunch of King's books were sort of um, highlighted recently. And so I know um, uh, I'm going to be getting some um, to um, augment the ones that I've checked out from the library. And, you know, reading um, uh, any great teachers or philosophers words, um, even if they're from a different time, um, is, uh, you know, like getting to hear them. And so I encourage you to, to look into that or um, look at the other resources that folks have shared. Um, we'll go ahead and um, complete the service and I invite you to please stay. And afterwards, we'll pretend to have lunch together.